dream of the universe of sanctifies us by commandments and commands us to occupy ourselves in the words of Torah. Okay. Here's what we've done the first two weeks. We've been the main topic has been how Jews treat one another and how Jews treat any of them. And what we did the first week is say that you can divide that into three categories. You can divide it into sources in Jewish legends and literature. We did that the first week. You can find out how Jews are to treat one another and do treat one another, hopefully, in Jewish law. And that was last week in reading my mind today's mission. And I said the third area in which you can find out how Jews treat one another with the, with the, the ways of Jewish life in, in that sense are, is by looking at Jewish culture. So where is a Jewish culture that is attached to all the other culture, but also has developed its own special music, is, you might say, the, the the culture of the Shem. The East European small communities that we all have heard about, where there was a good deal of anti-Semitism and the community was closed in, didn't have such a relationship with the Gentile community, but developed its own style, its own, you could say, traditional style, but it, it was just its own style. And that, that would be a good thing to study because it's not so far back that we really have no connection with it. Talmudic laws, it's hard to see ourselves that far back. But the Shemel, we have grandparents, if you're old enough, who were in the Shemel. Maybe they're gone, but you certainly overlap with some of them. You had uncles and family stories about what they used to do in the Shemel, which came here because some of them came from the Shemel to America. And that would be a good place to see what Jewish life and law and customs and way of life became not so long ago, and maybe how it relates to the earlier things we talked about, especially to Jewish law. How did it change? Uh, well, not so easy to go back to the shtetl because it's really not there anymore. But there's something very, very um, propitious. You like that? Propitious, P-R-O-P-I-T-I-O-U-S, I think. Uh, that, mean, that means serendipitous, right? <laughs> Too good. Um, because there was a book written in 1952, and happily, happily, Janet, yeah. happily, Janet, so we still have a copy of it. All over the place. But, Uh, and it's a book called Life is with People. We studied Life is with People a lot, so many years ago in Temple, I think in <clears throat> six or eight sessions, and we're going to do only one, not, obviously not everything in this. This book was put together by, now if you, if you studied anthropology in college, I think you're going to know these names. Matter of fact, if you studied anthropology, give me a name that comes to your mind. Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead had a task force which studied in 1952 the culture of the shtetl with great, as an anthropologist would do. What did Margaret Mead write? Margaret Mead write, I think it was uh, The Coming of Agent Samoa. Either it was that or Ruth Benedict. And Benedict worked with Margaret Mead on this before Ruth Benedict died far too soon. Um, and so, you couldn't have two better anthropologists going and studying the shtetl. And the third anthropologist who worked, who worked with him, Mark Zborowski, was a person whose parent family all lived in the shtetl, was in the shtetl as a young man, came here, became an anthropologist, etc. So, you can find out a lot about the shtetl in this book, and it's very easy to read. We're going to do only one section. I'm going to hand out some stuff to you, obviously. Um, the section on um, charity saves from death. 
should be Tzedakah, but, but they, these non-Jewish anthropologists didn't know it was Tzedakah. It was a lot of It was Margaret Kennedy. Yeah. 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 I want to read you just a couple of insights from the forward, and then we're at the forward and the figure with the forward and the magazine, right? And let's we'll see what you, uh, what you think about that. See, I don't make notes in this book because it's gin, and so it takes me a straight off. Margaret Vito, uh, about Ruth Benedict, who went around and interviewed children of the shtetl, grandchildren of the shtetl. I said, as she listened and questioned and recorded, she began to wonder if it would be possible to study systematically what was consistently the Jewish cultural element, which distinguished the perception of a Hungarian or a Polish Jew from a Hungarian or a Pole whose antecedents were Christian. That's what she was doing. What can we say? What's the, is a Jew just another Hungarian who happens to be another religion? You know? Is a Jew like a, a Christian a Hungarian whose Christianity affects him in some way? And a Jew, a Jew is a Jew, Hungarian, but who is affected by his religion. And she found out, of course, that it was far more than his religion that, that made him what he was. One more quote from the foreword. Ah, here we are. And side by side with the Jews' understanding of themselves, was the traditional Christian world with its self-images set against the contrasting image of the Jewish community. What the Jews thought of themselves and what the others thought of the Jews. Because those things merged at some point. As they, as, the, oh, listen to this. As the non-Jewish serving maid learned to enforce the dietary laws by which her employers lived, now in the shtetl, there were, there were well-to-do people who employed maids, from, generally from the non-Jewish community, who became a part of the household, the way maids often do in, in, in our culture. Um, so the non-Jewish serving maid, as she learned to enforce the dietary laws by which her employers lived, and learned a lot about Jewish culture, so in the schools of Poland, which Jewish kids did go to at certain points, committed the uh, little Jewish boys committed by their culture to value learning and piety above physical prowess read the stories of Polish heroes with admiration as well as with required disapproval of they were getting it out. And that covert admiration has perhaps played a part in the new Israeli patriotism. What an interesting insight that is. You, know, you can't be unaffected by the culture in which you live, even if you're not, not very happy with it. So 
is to just two quick insights from the foreword of the book that I, I thought would be a good start. And having said that, I'm handing out the material. Now, of course, what we're looking for in this, as well as just interesting stuff, is to see how much stuff that this is filtered down from the shtetl into American Jewish life. So, uh, here, you're right, don't you? Probably something. Okay. So, now you can see, welcome to, we're not doing all of this. I've given you some, some numerical headings as to the things we're going to read. Okay. So we're going to read section number one and then talk a bit about this, right? Who will do a couple of these paragraphs? It's on page 191 if you look at the page numbers. I'm sorry. Oh. oh. The varied meanings of the word mitzvah show both the importance of the commandments in everyday shepherd life and the central role which good deeds play in the enactment of those commandments. Mitzvah means commandment, but it may also mean the act that fulfills the command. It is a mitzvah to dower an orphan, orphan to get a man a job, to tend to the sick. The helpful act may be large or small. Do me a mitzvah, Fred will say. Take this letter to the post office. Or he may say, earn a mitzvah, meaning earn the credit you get for doing the mitzvah. It is a mitzvah to study, but it is also a mitzvah to profit from nice leather and go for a walk on a sunny day. A tired woman will say after a hard day at home or in the market, it's a mitzvah that I should get to bed early. Did <laughs> you ever hear people say anything like that? <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. One more prayer, I think. If a stroke of good luck comes, it's a mitzvah. Moreover, if one's sense of fairness is hurt by someone's evil acts and later restored by his downfall, one will say, it's a mitzvah on him, meaning it serves him right. A mother will say to a child who fell from a tree, it's a mitzvah on you. I've told you so many times and not to, told you so many times not to. It was a mitzvah not to climb trees, yeah. and when you do something that reminds you you should have, should have done it, that's a mitzvah on you. And look, what wonderfully broad the whole concept of mitzvah, which is originally Commandments 10, 10, 613, becomes the way of describing good stuff and bad stuff in, in, in shtetl life. Uh, and we, we might say, that's not really what the word means. The truth is, in this culture, that's what the word seems to mean, just like its opposite comes to mean it. Just about everything else. Let's do it, uh, the next two paragraphs. Uh, and Ethel, please. A violation of the commandments in the Vera is colloquial synonymous with the negative, undesirable act. It is an avira, which is a sin, isn't it? Yes, yes. 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 Avera. To Ken, my mother used to say, it's my favorite to leave food on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this, this is the perfect example of, yeah. of what how the culture did. To kindle fire on the Sabbath, but it is also a matter of to pay an exorbitant price for a purchase, or to wear a clean dress while doing dirty work. <laughs> According to the same semantic logic, one expresses pity by the word of era when something seems unjust. What an avera that he died so young. Thus, mitzvah and its opposite, avera, have carried beyond the strict sense of commandment or violation of this commandment. And have come to stand respectively for what is socially and culturally good and what is not. Okay, does anybody have a an association with this that they heard people do that. Grandparents that expanding the notion of I mean I hear it from people who say, well that means a mitzvah. Well, you know, it's a, it's a mitzvah to wear a new, new, new jacket, maybe for a Russian shot. It's not quite the permission of a mitzvah. 
think in our culture, the American Jewish culture, it, it has turned into meaning a good a good deed. You know, it's a mitzvah. And then what is aliva? Has anybody? Is that the same thing, Alibas? Yeah. Uh, uh, which means crossing uh, over the line into okay. the bad stuff. Okay, because I'm hearing a Yiddish pronunciation, so it's Aveira. not exactly like this. No, Aveira. Aveira? Yes. Aliva? It's a sin. Aveira? Okay. So, so tell me if you want to cut that. They still are mid. Maybe yeah, no, we've I done it too. Yeah. Is they took a, a, a word that was in Jewish law. Mitzvah, mitzvah, and he mitzvah, and God said, I command you this. And they took it and they just widened it up to, to be not just in the synagogue, not just what the rabbi says, but the whole life of the shtero could be divided into things you did. That's kind of there, and that's a mitzvah. Um, maybe that's what cultures do. Okay. Is there any significance Anything more? Is there any Well, you know that actually, I think you're thinking of the uh, the Z for the which right. are the Z and the S. Z S is a better transliteration. It's it's not it's mitzvah. It's mitzvah. mitzvah. There's, there's no vocalized. In this. So this is, but these are, listen, these are scholarly anthropologists. They're going to be in the right way to matter. No matter what you say. <laughs> okay, anything else on this one? Just, well, okay, that's, it's a good start. Let's go to number two, which goes to three paragraphs. Okay. Uh, another reader, please. Yes, Gail. Good deed. Good deeds include spiritual as well as material benefits. One can give alms, words of comfort, a loan of money, wishes for good luck, advice, have an asu, and all are good deeds. Ma'asim to be for principle. Charity is not only one part of ma'asim to be, but is a very important part. The most popular word for is this is one. That would be, when we talk about it, we say tzedakah. Mm -hmm. The Israeli pronunciation. By the way, words that come from Hebrew into Yiddish almost always have the accent moved back toward the beginning of the word. Whereas classic Hebrew words, accent almost always goes to the end. It's not really. Mazal tov. So you say Mazal Tov. If you say Mazal Tov, or if you say Mazal Tov, you say Mazal Tov, you say Mazal Tov, most people say. This is one of the Hebrew words which have been incorporated into the Yiddish vocabulary. And its real meaning is not charity, but justice. Social justice would be more accurate in this context. Sadoka covers all acts of giving from the uh, to the uh, No, here this is what this is from the Dova, which is the The alms given to the beggar, to the nearest Kasudi, Good. a form of benefice in which mere material help is combined with the stowing of loving kindness and which is therefore of a higher form. One more. Life in the shtetl begins and ends with Sadoka. When a child is born, the father pledges a certain amount of money for distribution to the poor. At a funeral, the mourners distribute coins to the beggars who swarm the cemetery, chanting, Sadoka will save from death. It's not Sadoka will save. Some people. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's stop here for a second. Um, yes, every term. Just one second. Oh, one second. One second. Uh, is that something that's, that's still carried through in Jewish life? 
Well, we give a donation when someone dies. We give a donation to charity in their honor. Events in the army. I recall, you know, we were just talking years ago. We used to go to the cemetery, and there was always these guys around would say a prayer for you and put their hand out to get a donation. I'm glad you. I'm glad that's in your memory bank. It's not in mine. I've only seen it in, uh, in books. Anybody else have that? Yeah, we were on Waldheim. Yeah, we were on You're on Irving Park. We were on Waldheim. It's still done. I was in South Shore. It's still done in New York City. Yeah. 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 It's still done in New York City because I have relatives in New York City. So if I have to go to a funeral or a wedding, there are uh, beggars or that. You know, they're, they're the Orthodox and they're dressed like that and they they have their hand out. They're ready. So they still do that. So. But they also say prayer. They say prayer. For you. Right. Uh, I think that we change it a bit every single time. If you have an anniversary or you have, our temple sends you the, the, the thing, the choices of where you can make a donation. So you should be coordinating in your brain. <coughs> when good things happen, you say thank you by giving a little to them. Well, was that true in your families? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're getting to put you, as you can imagine, we're getting to push you very soon. Just from reading here, what really doesn't sit comfortably with me is when the beggars swore in the cemetery saying, Sadaka will save you from death. It just seems to me as if Sadaka is something that should be given with a free heart, not that you're buying. Well, they picked that phrase up from someplace in the tradition. Um, and I'm not sure, don't, don't quite remember where they picked it up from. But, uh, as it, and there, there's a section we'll read, we can get to it, uh, on the, on the Schnurrers. Oh, uh, so we the we're going to get there. And that, that ties in very closely. But one of the answers is, the beggar, the Schnurrer, offers you an opportunity for a mitzvah. Right. And you better get, because if you turn down that opportunity for a mitzvah, you've, you've done something not only wrong, but something very foolhardy as well. Uh, so the, and the beggar was an accepted, necessary part of the community. At least that's the way the anthropologists did. Um, and but now, what they used to do, I think what they did in the shtetl mainly is they said, make a contribution to me. I'm poor and Sadaka saves from death. You know, if you like to interpret words, you would say, well, not really from death, from a kind of spiritual So that's all right. Um, but, uh, so, but then it's become, if you find one of these folks at the cemetery, and very often you see people who look like itinerant rabbis, uh, at cemeteries, on, on Sundays especially, who are there and offer their services to say an El Moe Rahim, in a prayer for you, your loved one who's, who's buried here. So um, so there's a service exchange. So it's funny, there there's a service exchange. He does something for you by saying the prayer. Um, I'm sure they do. Show arms to America, right? That's, that's a different, different. You certainly wouldn't see them in the, in the Holy Name Cemetery, right? Not even Catholic folks. So that's a different way. Stony, then Terry. That changes the um, the face of it. In in it changes it from a gift of giving and give from the heart, like she said, to an obligation. And which is it? Well, no, I, I think what, what, what this book will, will tell you is that it was felt as a good thing to do, but it was also felt as an obligation. And if you try to split them and see which part was larger, I think it is a difficulty doing that. It's, it's really both. 
to come to the house and ask for donations. Mm -hmm. He would come from uh, Milwaukee. He was the, uh, the grand rabbi from Milwaukee. He used to come. Wow. And his son would come, or he would come, and he would come at Hanukkah for donations. Lubovitch has, has had a large following in Milwaukee for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Years and years back when we decided to bring in some Lubovitch rabbis into the congregation for a weekend to teach about what they believed, what they thought would be interesting, and he was. Uh, but they were all from Milwaukee, and um, they uh, they were really doing well. And then after a, after a Shabbos morning thing that they did, one said to the other, one took me by the arm, and the other said, said, "Come on, let's take the rabbi out and make him a bench." That 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 sort of put them down. Yes. Well, I went to Hebrew school. Southside Hebrew in the South Shore, we had to give a nickel for a leaf on a tree. Oh, yeah. And we gave 20 nickels, it was a dollar, you got a tree. And the first time I went to Israel, I wanted to ask, can you show me where the trees are? You put a stamp, you got a stamp. Yeah. stamp. That, that was my candy. That was my candy. I felt so holy. If we're going to get to the Schnurrs, Well, I mean, they, 
he had to we're going to talk about it, but I think they hit at it more than hit at it when they talk about the fact that these are these are deeds of beneficence too. Ivan's words of comfort, loan of money, advice, a pot of hot soup. All our good deeds, Masin Tobin. Uh, money was such an issue though among poor people that that was that it, it, it was it was prime. It was prime gift. But we still in the congregation we have social justice and we have caring community that fulfills a lot of these this project. Yeah. Right. And they talk about it in terms of caring community. Community cares, and we're going to get to some more if we get beyond this. Uh, okay. Um, okay, number uh, three. Let's see. Social justice of the shtetl is not wholly voluntary and not wholly individual. Much of it is, and there is, wide latitude for individual performance. Nevertheless, it is firmly woven into the organization of the community, or rather, it provides the central mechanism by which the community functions. The interweaving of individual benefaction with collective community service of the voluntary with the compulsory of religious injunction with civic obligation is essential to the organization and the flavor of the shtetl. Mm -hmm. So it's this combination of I want to, I have to. And somehow everybody falls someplace here. Now, what's been, what I've found interesting in our conversation in the last couple of weeks uh, last couple weeks is that. Uh, how frustrating it is when you're looking for that button, right? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of empathy for that. Um, but, okay. So we we've had a lot of we had a lot of conversation during the last week or so about I hate it and my father hated it when they, they told us how much we had to give. But somebody came around and told us that's how much you have to give. That seems to have been, and you'll see it very soon, not just a natural part of the show. They were doing their job to come around and ask you. And they were cut. And so that, that was natural for them. It is, it is, as I've heard you talk about it, very unnatural and very irritating. Maybe one of the most irritating things about Sadaka are the attempts to turn the screws on people. And I'm wondering how, why and how that kind of changed over, over the years. Uh, because here it makes it very clear that uh, compulsory and voluntary are not so far apart. Sure. Okay, so um, I know I shared this before, so uh, my, I'm first generation. My mother was 19 when she came here, and one of her most vivid memories of being in the shtetl was the close-knit and the knowing everything that was going on. And when she was a little girl, her bubby, her bubby Yetta, took her out by the hand, and then her cousin, and they go from door to door, and she knew who had a better week, and they had to give a half a challah to her. They had a half a challah that they would give her, and they had baskets. And that's what they did in the first part of the morning. And then in the afternoon, she would distribute them to the people who had a bad week. And it, she was the emissary. But the whole life, like you see here, was centered on the balancing act. You know, it's almost like Tabby sitting on the roof. People need it. And you better give if you have a little bit extra. It was who you were and how you lived. And God forbid if you didn't, you were shunned. This was it, it, the expectation was this is what we do for each other. And we should, she's a tough lady. In America, individual choice, much, much more important. Right? I can choose to do this. And not a central part of our life. No. It's not central, so we think about it the tax type. 
where are we going to give our charity to? <laughs> Not a daily, weekly kind of, a, of, a, of existence. You're right. Uh, okay, uh, the giving and middle of the page, the giving of Siddhartha. Uh, then. The giving of Siddhartha, the performance of Maasim Tovim, are basic not only to the functioning of the shtetl, but also to being a good Jew. A variety of proverbs, sayings, and comments define the readiness to do good deeds as an earmark of the real Jew. One knows a Jew by his pity, it is said. One knows him by his Yiddish heart, soft, warm, open to appeal. A Jew is a pitying man. Sounds like a folk song. <laughs> to sympathize with sorrow is a typical Jewish trait. This badge of group membership has been so worked into the structure of the society that it serves as a channel through which property, <coughs> learning, and services are diffused. Thank you. Yeah, that's pretty clear. Uh, I'll go, I'll go a bit. in the middle of the next paragraph, which is the mark with the number. The fortunate man, here's the thing we haven't talked about. The fortunate man is the one who is in position to give. The unfortunate is the one who is under pressure to accept. Granted the correct situation, accepting is not necessarily painful. But under any circumstances, giving is counted among the great gratifications of life. Mm. Has that come down to us? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 yes, sir. I can't count how many times I have said to someone who I consider to be a very good person, give us the gift of accepting something gracious, whether it's a big thing or a little thing. Allow Allow, 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 Hard to refuse the schnorrer because he offers you an opportunity to do it. And you, and you just are not programmed to turn things like that. Okay, 197, uh, number four. Another reader? Yes. Does that follow that the four are three of the applications for Maxine Toby? Obviously, the favorite of fortune are in a position to perform more spectacular ones than the very poor and lowly, but in the after world, they will be measured in terms of real merit. According to the code set down in the Shulkana book, even a poor person who obtains the support for the contribution of charity is obliged to give charity from that which is given to him. That's what we read in the Maimonides Code. Regardless of economic status, general admiration or filial pride is often expressed through accounts of good deeds. My parents were very generous. Even in bad times, we had several rank of bankruptcies with our store. Father still brought guests home to eat with us, and we did not have much ourselves. Mother literally took things off her back to give to the I think it's interesting that over the years, I've heard so many stories, like Sharon's story about what was remembered through a family's history, family history, about things that went on in the shtetl and what people do for one another. And the, and the memories usually are very graphic pictures of people and giving and homes and what it was like. Um, so even though it's now how many generations away? Two, maybe three generations away, maybe even four in some cases. Um, it seem, it's, it's not so lost. Um, more lost than I was last generation, that's true. So if you, down, if you looked down the west side, it was almost shtetl living. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. it, it, we have very vivid memories mm -hmm. of the same type of shtetl life, charity. Mm -hmm. In New York, when, when the immigrants came, it was probably much like that too. When we moved into Cleveland, you know, 
obviously I was quite young, but what struck me at the time was by choice we created our own shuttle. We lived in a community. There was never a question of the high school being <coughs> open or closed for the high holidays. It stayed open with the two teachers and the six kids who were not Jewish. <laughs> but it was open. But one of them was that. Well, this was in Cleveland Heights in Cleveland, which I think they were about eight shoals within walking distance, easy walking distance from my house. But you keep mentioning the word shore, which t totally brings back a memory. We had very little, life was a struggle. This was in the early years. And not at the time at the time, but every week, and if not every single week, every other week, there would be somebody who would knock at the back door and ask me for money. And my mom always gave him a dollar or two dollars. But, she, you know, <laughs> the common phrase used in the house was one of the schnorrers is bad. And she'd say, here, take some money. And I said, he's a schnorrer, why are you giving him money? And her response was, when somebody asks, we have to give him money. Well, the other answer was, he, he's in our territory. We're living in his territory. But, we, give, but, we don't give to the other guy to give that to him. But he didn't go there. And it was in a world where being Jewish 
You could also say it was very difficult, much more difficult than the world would have been. And, and, but for people to have the remembrance of living it with joy, and it's good to be a Jew, I mean, you always, you always want to go up to a person and shake hands and say, I'm so proud of you. And being able to have this attitude in the midst of all the, all the bad stuff. It's good to be a Jew. I live that We're getting a lot of geographical references. <laughs> <laughs> we used to, we had a sun parlor. We used to watch all the people walk down, all dressed up with pants and jackets. And it was just, I mean, it was wonderful. Almost like being in Israel, the hope of fallen Jews. And, and there was a pull between being an American yes. and a Jew, which, which was certainly not true in the end of I mean, you were Hungarian, maybe because you had to be, or, but you knew, you knew basically. All right, we're moving on. Um, six, six. A reader. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, somebody. Arthur. Good deeds lie in the realm of man to man. Yet this relationship, like all others, is conditioned by the underlying relationship of man to God. As Shukhan Haram Haruch. Of revised, a man should consider the fact that he is constantly praying for the sustenance of the Holy One, blessed be he, just as he prays that the Holy One listens to his cry of supplication. So should he listen to the supplication of the poor. The names used for God bring it home in comparison. God is invoked as he who feeds the hungry, he who comforts the widow, he who clothes the naked, he who heals the sick. Interesting that, uh, what, that that God that you you try and do what, what God does, and the name and the, these are these are the names. Not so much God who commands this that this and that, which is all obviously there in the tradition, but God is the you know, ah that's what I should be doing. And then Christianity says that uh, imitatio Jesus. Or what would Jesus do? Right? I've seen a few what would Moses do well. <laughs> uh, only among kids. <laughs> uh, but uh, the Jews say imitation of God. You, you are in God's image, so you should be doing what God does. What does God do? That's what God does. Uh, okay. Seven, page 199. You're doing great. Poor of the week. Anybody want to read the poor of the week? Or don't be the poor of the week. I'll read the poor of the week. Yeah? The poor, the weak, the ignorant feel that they have a right to ask for help. Since the haves are under obligation to share with the half ones, it is correct procedure to ask for favors and services if necessary with expostulation cries and tears. Yet though it is correct, there is an intense repugnance to asking material aid. Even the lowly will suffer much and go to great lengths in order to avoid it. There is comparatively little reluctance to turn those who are wiser and more learned for advice and instruction or for mediation and solving disputes. To ask for money or goods, however, is something there is small fear of pauperizing a population accustomed to regard charity as social justice because to receive can be as painful and to give can be so rewarding. This is this uh, feeling that we've been reading about, which is keep in mind how would the poor feel when they have to take. And if you keep that in mind, you will be able somehow to give and figure out a way to let a person's dignity remain as it was. Uh, and that, that's why when you take that to a, to a great extreme, the one that most of you just couldn't, couldn't relate to was the, the Vaimantri's law that if, uh, if a prisoner or someone who is arrested, if, if a wrongdoer uh, is caught, 
he, you should, and this is the prison, I think he put the words there, he should be given a station in life at least equal to the station he had before, before, and have some of the, some of the emoluments that he had before. Now, nobody here like that. <laughs> I don't like him much either, but you, you do, the, the heart of it is feel what it, what it feels like to be the other in those situations. And that seems to run through here. It doesn't say give every, if a guy was, was, was a vice president, make him a vice president or something else, especially after he stole the government's money. But sometimes that's no, no more political conversation. Um, but uh, do, but keep in mind his humanity. And that's what comes through here, too. It's hard to be a receiver of tzedakah. You know you have to do it, but it's hard. It can be painful. And giving can, thank goodness, giving can be so rewarding. Because if giving weren't so rewarding, you wouldn't be able to give to people <laughs> who, who need it and who find, who find joy in being able to receive it. And no matter what, and as it said in a section up here, a little bit higher, you're never going to pauperize the shtetl. Say you'll take so much money from this one to give to that one. There's not that much money around anyway that people have to, to take away from other people. So that won't happen. Uh, OK. Nine. What happened to Ada? Sorry, to a recipient. Oh, oh, yeah. Middle of, uh, middle of page 200, where you see it says, eight, but get to go down to a little opening block to be a recipient. A reader? I'll read. If you really ran a business based on Tsugata, 
instead of only profit. <laughs> well, you would feel that somehow, you know, but somehow they weren't. We somehow the mother here in the story, I'm guessing, was did not did not go out of business. But my great grandmother, who I knew quite well, in the shtetl had a kosher restaurant. Now, in the shtetl, not too many people ate in a restaurant, but she kept this little restaurant going and most of the time gave the food because the people were poor. And she was in that restaurant, she said, maybe four years before they came to, the, to America. Four years. In a shtetl where people didn't eat in restaurants. Mm -hmm. She kept it going. And she wasn't so wealthy herself. So they managed to find a way to do this that they felt was in a very difficult atmosphere, very. much more difficult than, than, than anyone, I think, that any one of us has grown up. Do more on this? Do you like this? Irene? I think it's in keeping in what with the temple does with the, um, uh, what's it called, the good faith? Um, caring committee? Caring committee? No, 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 not the caring committee. There is a, there is a cafe in Uptown oh, oh, that we go to serve. Inspiration. Yes, inspiration. I'm sorry, I couldn't think of it. Inspiration Cafe to that you can help out if you want, but that they don't, the people that come in there, sometimes they um, they are not a people of means and they are served just like everybody else to preserve their dignity. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, you know what, the, the, the value that we have, sometimes it's not, it's, it's not the same as some Americans who are Maybe they're Jewish, maybe they're not Jewish, but sometimes the poor in America, they don't have the same value things. They, they just, you know, they're perpetually poor, the ones that are poor from generation to generation to generation. Because I see that as it's like, um, one time one of my friends was teaching in a very poor neighborhood in Chicago and he was collecting for the Sudan, you know, which was, you know, no, no clothes, no nothing. And they said, we're collecting for the poor. and then. The kids all said, "But we're the poor." Mm -hmm. So I think if you tell the, you know, if you tell your kids uh, that you're poor, but you deserve to get more, it's like a different thing than you're telling your kids, "We may not have it, but we don't don't go out and beg, you know, or don't go out and you know tell people that we need it, because then it's a Chandra. Yeah. You know, it's a different value system." I don't know if one is good better than the other. It's just ours, you know. Mm -hmm. We run a food pantry at the township, and um, we keep bags from the Jewel and Dominic's, whatever people want to transfer. What we give them to bags from mm -hmm. stores that their neighbors would not see that they are taking food from a food pantry. Yeah. 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 The Jewish community. Yeah. Yeah. In the United States, and certainly Chicago, has taken a lot of these things to heart uh, and, and has programs for the needy and for, for those who places like the arts. And, the, and we haven't forgotten that. Uh, it's, it's all voluntary. That's, that's really, that's, maybe that's the whole difference. Whereas this was clearly the community expected it of you, and you would respond because it's a joy to give. Maybe that's the uh, the formula you would give to somebody, and it's a, it's a different society here. But there 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 are very wealthy people who give large amounts. Not so true in the show. There's two factors. One, we become distant from the giver. I mean, we give, but we give to an organization, and they distribute. We don't have direct contact per se to the person we're giving to. Because we live in a much broader community. Which, according to his rules of what are the highest levels and lowest levels of Africa, that would be good because they don't know us and we don't know them. But, but it loses something in direct contact. And the other thing is, people had a different feeling of what God, their relation to God. They felt that God was watching everything they did, and if they did a good deed, they were going to be rewarded, and if they didn't do a good deed, they would be punished. I think 
our view isn't the same. We have uh, we don't feel that we're puppets on a you know and that is watching every individual one. It's our own conscience that is. We have a different. I have a different relationship to God than I think these people. So they did it for reward and punishment. If you don't give, you're going to suffer. And if you do give, you will be rewarded. Nine. Page 202, nine. Uh, 
no, it's the hospice means a uh, a boarding like like a terrible boarding house. But did they have a place if you had a sick like uh, like a Ronald McDonald's house? They had a place if your loved one was being treated. You had a place where you could go, and it was supported by the community that would take care of relatives of the sick person. Oh, it was you're right. I, I, yeah. I recall here. Yeah. In the shuttle, that was kind of. Yeah, keep going. Um, the city has this a miserable construction on the edge of town, somewhere out beyond the bathhouse. Mm -hmm. In the shuttle vocabulary, the word has become synonymous with the most wretched slump. The hectish may also be supported by members of the hypnosis or Hedon, whose task is to provide indigent strangers with board and shelter, usually by distributing them among the men of means if they do not find a host for themselves. And when you get old, the home for the edged, Moishev Zakanim, is supported by yet another society to take care of the very old people who either cannot or will not be helped by their families. Some of them feel it the lesser of two evils to be supported by <coughs> personal funds to which all contribute rather than to be dependent upon their own children even though the children may plead for the privilege of supporting them. The dignity of age can better endure the impersonal than the personal benefaction. One more, one more, please. When they die, they will be buried by the Holy Association, Kevra Kadisha, which is in charge of bringing Jews to Israel's brain. To this, as to all community benefactions, each contributes according to Unlike most of the others, however, the Hebra Kedisha serves all alike, the rich as well as the poor. When death occurs, the community takes over. The family, presumably too prostrated with grief to occupy themselves with practical affairs, are proscribed from busying themselves with funeral arrangements or with everyday affairs of living. They devote themselves to mourning the dead with the customary rituals and observances, while others arrange for the funeral bring them food, and perform any additional services that are required. A nogin, Rich man. Who, nogin, pronounce it Rich. who dies will have paid his burial expenses many times over in contributions to the Hebra Kedisha. But when the moment comes, he will be buried by the community like any other member as part of his automatic rights. Well, talk, talk about a listing in the bulletin of the shtetl and moving into the very spot. I mean, you can read our bulletin and you see what I'm listing, right? Hmm? This is Abram Tavari, Abram Tavari. Can I ask that theory um, a question? Here we all went. I don't know. Is this like the Woodcock pronunciation with the voice inserted in the words toy bra and the soy meat? Yeah, I tell you what we're going to talk about. Yes, it is. A certain pronunciation of the Ao, the was, I think, I think it was the area. It's what the group is. So, I don't know the answer, but I certainly know it's, it's, it's not Hebrew. <laughs> well, it's more from I mean, the Yiddish. It's, it's, yes, it's Hebrew, but it's, it's not mispronounced. It's more from the Yiddish, but that's how my grandmother. Well, right, but remember, these are... They're Hebrew words, but they're but Hebrew the words, Right, and generally the difference is O and O can become OI, as if there's a Yod after it. But the accent, basic thing is the accent moves down to the end, which is the, back to the beginning part, which is very strange for all of us. So think of Talmud, Torah, but Torah, or Torah, all the same thing. Except Tyra sounds like it's a good friend. <laughs> um, I think that also, depending on the country these people lived in, uh, there are different pronunciations of Yiddish. And Bosbi. And Bosbi. That's English. Oh, that's Chicago. That's Chicago. Latka and Latki, right? Yeah. Yes. This is the way our temple started. 
was always the uh, funeral part, the burial, the burial part. And A. Joshua began now with the building, not even with a uh, formed congregation necessarily, but with a cemetery. Mm -hmm. Enough for him and Jews had come together and uh, formed, and what do they want to do first? Buy a cemetery. Mm -hmm. It was a burial yeah. society where they helped one another. It was a burial, burial society. Mm -hmm. And that was a BJ and a burial society for years and years and years with mm -hmm. chair people and mm -hmm. who collected money and made sure that the, the uh, the yearly funds, upkeep, permanent, perpetual care. Went through about four, four changes. Yeah, right. But I want I just want to get to the end here because I think it's so interesting. Uh, okay. officers of the association go from house to house collect money. It is perhaps in these house-to-house -house collections that the full burden of social justice is felt most keenly. It is beautiful to give. It is gratifying to give. To reap honor on earth and lay up rewards in heaven. To enhance the yichas, the general um, societal reputation of one's family, and to enhance the marriage prospects of one's children, to enjoy the warmth of feeling, I am a Jew, I am obeying the law. But the shtetl is a poor place. The proudest nogi, rich man, of them all, is not a rich man by Western standards. And at every turn, one must give. The coins that tinkle ceaseless, ceaselessly into tin boxes and outstretched palms are small coins but their number is staggering. One gives and gives again, and then once more is asked to give. The fundraisers march into one's home. Are you not happy to see them? We need from you so much, they say. They will not be bashful in their request, since to ask for someone else is not a shame, but a virtue. I know you can afford it. I know you'll want to give it. He who urges others to give charity and causes them to practice it, earns a greater reward than the one who gives. There's a, there's a good incentive for taking your volunteer hours to go out and be a collector, right? There will be arguments, off offers, and counter offers. There's too much, I cannot give that. But it is needed, you must. In the end, make the collectors depart. Probably neither empty-handed nor satisfied. <laughs> everyone must give down to the poorest. Everyone wants to give, wants to give. But almost everyone is in financial straits himself, and almost no one can give easily. If one has only two rolls for the Sabbath meal, how shall he satisfy the open mouths of all the little tin boxes? Isn't that an image that people are hungry in your house and here the little kids they want to roll? And the boxes are sitting there, sort of flapping their lids open and saying, a little coin, a little coin. Wonderful image, I think. Uh, at that point, the poor man, looking at the nogi, thinks, with money you can buy a place in this world and the future world. But the nogi, the rich man himself, is turning out his empty pockets to satisfy the fundraisers that he has no more to give. When one is strained beyond his means, then it's hard to be a Jew. In return for his donation, the Nogi will receive covet honor from the community. But as its Hebrew root implies, covet is heavy. That's what's covet, heavy, covet, people say that. You know, we, we, he's got covet, isn't it? Lucky everybody 
everyone really appraises him for his reputation. Coven is generally heavy too. You earn it somehow. Okay, yes, are you with me? Okay, all right. Do we have anything to say about that? Uh, okay, here's the one we're waiting for. 210. Yeah, I'm going to number 13. Number 13. Okay, somebody was starting on the shtetl and vigor. Somebody, please. While yeah. all the shtetl strings and pants to win the joy of giving and to escape the shame of public assistance, one group makes it a business to ask and to receive the professional beggars, the schnorr and the feitler. Bakler, I think what I've heard is Batlin, but um, that the beggar is held in contempt. The beggar is held in contempt, not because he accepts from his inferiors, for none is beneath him in status, but because he asks for donation. Nevertheless, he has function if not status. He is by definition the opportunity for good deeds, and as such helps the members of the community to amass credits in heaven. Giving to a beggar rates only a minor credit. Uh -huh. It is almost mandatory on certain holidays and celebrations, and if they receive less than their due, they do not hesitate to protest. Doesn't it sound as if the Schnur is the walking Sinoka box? Yeah. <laughs> Shows up at your house. Well, it's not like Keep going. The beggar, the beggars carried a large sack and put everything they were given into it. When they came to a house, they would say, get a novea, give alms, and they wouldn't refuse a beggar, and you had to give him something. If you didn't have anything just then, you asked him to come a little later. Such charity is given openly, with no need for face saving since the beggar has no face. Let's come back to that. The professional beggar has its regular beat, and it is jokingly said that he may pass it on at death to a successor, or he may give part of it as a dowry for his daughter. There is such a wealth of Jewish humor about the shtetl. If you had by any chance have the book at home, Nathan Osville's The Treasury of Jewish Folk, and a lot of you do, it's so worth having. Go to the section on beggars and see the, the, the humor that the beggar said. The beggar said, uh, well, who, who is that? Okay, you'll have to look in the book for it. Well, the, the, famous, the famous joke is that the beggar was begging, and the, and the rich man said, well, I had a very bad week. So the beggar says, so why should I suffer? <laughs> <laughs> I yes. said, Oh. Well, uh, um, okay. Uh, who was reading? I was reading. Ethel, okay. okay. Where did you want to go? One other couple of paragraphs. Uh, the attitude toward the mendicant is mixed. As an individual who begs, he is despicable. Children who ask for things are told with grown up disapproval. Don't fish more. As an occasion for mitzvahs, however, the beggar is an instrument of grace. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. well, right? that, that you need to have them. That, it's like uh, something is bad for you to eat, but you need them anyway. It's, it's, it's he is well aware of his utility, and it accounts in large measure for an arrogance of the shadow beggars, which is a, a which is a matter of amazement to strangers, and has been the subject of frequent comment by Yiddish authors. Okay, somebody else take over? Maybe? The vendor is an important member of the show. He is everywhere, in the market, in the show, and by the weddings, or special tables, except for him. When the Nobid's daughter is married to the great scholar, works spreads throughout the region in a rich bank of what will be held, and vendors flock from the flower <laughs> shop to feast, receive alms and dance with bread. Their kingdom, however, is the cemetery. <laughs> On the road to the grave, snorers of all ages and both sexes are posted in small distances, stretching out their hands and repeating, "Happily, charity will save from death." The respectable and handsome despise the snorers, but he is cowed by their rages and their explosives. It's the Schnorr is an artist and curses producing the most elaborate and sophisticated 
called people who do that. A strange, and every community has strange characters who sort of bring the unusual, sort of be against the, against the text. Uh, and so here he is. Everybody, nobody likes him, but he succeeds. Um, is he a beggar for himself only, or does he share some of what he gets? Well, generally, they are, you would think they have family. In, in, who don't live very well. family or extended? Uh, I don't know. We always thought he would go back to the show and give the money to the show. That's when they would come and we were in the lobby and I think it's, it would be very difficult to figure out where that money eventually was. A, a, a later a 
a, uh, a picture, in some sense a picture drawn later, of what the Bible said, what the Torah said, what the tradition said about what God and Israel are to be like to one another. But you can see it also in the relationship. Margaret B. Zubaraska said, in the relationship with people in the shtetl to one another. It's pretty powerful. Uh, is Israel the country or Israel the people? Israel is one of the people. This is really pre, pre Israel. Well, okay, if you ever can, and I bet a lot of you have this on your shows. I used to. Life is with people. It's not a the library that I, any of the entire suburban libraries. But it was so popular. It was done by Zilborowski. And if you uh, bring Janet a couple of bagels, maybe she will let you. Okay. 